Hello and welcome to India Global. I'm Gauri Devedi. Before we take a look at the big story that we're tracking, the headlines this evening. First up, Prime Minister Modi's historic visit to Poland with trade and defence being the top focus. Prime Minister Modi also held talks with his Polish counterpart, Donald Tusk. A deadly deluge hits Bangladesh as well as Tripura. India has also denied that the floods in Bangladesh had anything to do with the release of dam water in its, from its territory. Pakistan arrests man for sparking riots in UK. Man has been charged with cyber terrorism for spreading misinformation. Australia comes out with right to disconnect law that comes into force. Uh, the law is meant to protect employees who do not want to respond beyond work hours. And Sri Lanka announces visa-free access to Indians for six months. Uh, India, US and UK are among the 35 countries that have been offered a visa-free access to the island country. focus this evening on India Global. Prime Minister Modi is in Poland. Remember, it's part of his visit later on to Ukraine. Uh, Prime Minister Modi's historic visit comes after uh, the last PM who was there was in 1979, which was Moraji Desai. He held talks with his Polish counterpart, Donald Tusk. Uh, and uh, India and Poland also upgraded their ties to a strategic partnership. And it was a 360-degree focus, which included defense, trade, social security, amongst several other aspects. Uh, Prime Minister Modi also paid tribute at the tomb of the unknown soldier and uh, the visit was also meant to strengthen ties with the European Union. Before I get in my colleague Vishnu Som who's on ground tracking this uh, important visit, let me first get in uh, sound bites and, and what really Prime Minister Modi and his Polish uh, counterpart said where Prime Minister Modi also spoke about how this is not an era of war and how peace and diplomacy needs to be really given a chance. Listen in to those important sound bites, then we get in Vishnu to tell us more. Raksha ke kshetra mein karibhi sahiyog humare gehre aapasi vishwaas ka pratik hai. Ik kshetra mein aapasi sahiyog ko sradhad banaya jayega. Innovation or talent humare dono desho ki yuva shakti ki pehchan hai. Skilled workforce के लिए भलाई के लिए, skilled workers की भलाई के लिए और mobility को बढ़ावा देने के लिए दोनों पक्षों के बीच social security agreement पर सहमति बनी है। Friends, भारत और पोलैंड अंतर्राष्ट्रीय मंच पर भी करीबी तालमेल के साथ आगे बढ़ रहे हैं। all right, uh, Vishnu Som joins us live from Kiev, where Prime Minister Modi will be headed next. Uh, even as he made it very clear today, Vishnu, that uh, it is not an era of war. He also spoke about how peace needs to be prioritized through diplomacy. Take us through what can we expect uh, when he lands in Ukraine and also the key highlights of his visit today in Poland. Well, I think tomorrow is going to be a key day to see just uh, whether there is some sort of a major solution which India has thought up out of the box is a phrase that I've been using non-stop for the last couple of days. But I do believe it appropriately sums up what most of us um, are, are, are hoping for, that there is some sort of a solution, some sort of thinking which um, is not conventional because at this stage the entire war between Russia and Ukraine is uh, really sort of um, stuck. Both sides are playing a dangerous game of brinkmanship. Uh, they're suffering huge casualties on either side. Tens of thousands of soldiers have been killed. The economy of both countries very, very badly uh, impacted. The global economy has been impacted as well. India has political capital here in Kiev. We've got political capital in Moscow as well. And therefore, can there be some sort of a solution which is acceptable to both sides to get them in right earnest onto the negotiating table. What would the contours of that actually be? Uh, would there be a trade-off of territory, for example? In the last couple of weeks, uh, Ukrainian soldiers have gone into Kursk the first time 
uh, that anybody has invaded or gotten into an incursion of, of Russia since the Second World War. Um, on the other hand, Ukraine has been losing territory more and more steadily on the east in the Donetsk and the Lugansk front. So could there be a trade-off where, uh, you know, you stick with, Russia sticks with what they have in the east uh, and they do not expand any further uh, while Ukrainian soldiers come down. Now that is a solution which at the moment is not acceptable to Ukraine who say that, look, every square inch of our territory is important. Uh, but then, you know, there is a process of give and take which has to be established and that certainly goes for Russia as well. For example, the Crimea, which was annexed by Russia. Uh, the Ukrainians feel very strongly about that and that took place in 2014. Would that be a possible part of the solution as well? It has to involve some level, many say, of a territorial swap uh, or both sides agreeing not to expand further. So will that be a possibility? We'll know tomorrow. The PM is going to be here tomorrow morning. It's going to be a short trip. He'll be meeting the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Will there be a joint statement between both sides? Uh, that's unclear at this stage. But that would be important because that would be an indicator that, you know, there has been some sort of agreement, perhaps looking ahead at the future. But India is very clear. Not an era of war. Uh, it is very much an era of coming to the table and ensuring that dialogue and diplomacy can solve this horrible conflict. You were also asking me about Poland, a very important visit. Both sides have now raised the level of that equation uh, to a strategic partnership, um, whether it's Polish support in de defense, Atman Nirbharta, number one, number two, art artificial intelligence, green technology. These are all areas that Prime Minister Modi spoke about and invited Poland uh, to actually be a part of. So let's see where India and Poland go with that relationship. But 45 years after uh, an Indian Prime Minister visited Poland. It is a very important visit indeed at this stage. But let's come back to Ukraine briefly. Rajiv Gupta is known as the farmer king of Ukraine, a man who came to this country with $200 in his pocket. He now accounts his company, Kusum Enterprises, for more than 40% of the sales of all Indian manufactured medicines in this country. It's a company which has continued to work throughout the war. It's one of the most incredible examples of Indian entrepreneurship anywhere perhaps in the world. More than three decades back, a young Indian, Rajiv Gupta, came to Ukraine with what about a couple of hundred dollars in his pocket. He now runs one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in this country. 40% of all Indian pharmaceuticals sold in Ukraine come from Kusum Enterprises, from Kusum Pharma, and he joins us over here. $200 is all that you came with, right? Yeah, that was a big money for that time. <laughs> it's still big money now. But that, but that said, um, you now employ a thousand odd people in this country and you continue to operate despite the war. How difficult has it been? It was a bit difficult initially. But if you see the courage of local people, you feel like, no, you can continue. Why not? And you employ how many people over here? Uh, 1,100. We've seen um, the Indian community over here, by which I mean students, of course, leave en masse a couple of years back. You helped out in that process. There's a small Indian community in Kiev as well, right? Uh, did they all stay behind um, or have they all gone back? Uh, I think maybe up to 10 families left behind. It. And out and, and how many yes. families were there earlier? Uh, it, more than 500 people. Yeah. But uh, uh, currently, I think maybe up to 20 people are living in yeah. Ukraine. It's a bit, uh, you know, you have to get used to of, uh, sirens, air attacks, alerts, you know. Uh, what does are... that feel like? Because I, I, I mean, I'm coming over here after two years. And the first thing I heard as we drove into, as, as our train came into to Kiev, was an air raid siren. The train stopped for a few moments, then carried on going. And then I heard it again today. And I remember what it was like two years back. That's not changed. It's become worse in a sense. You're getting used to this. Like, uh, Vishnu, for, from, if you start from the yesterday evening till now, 69 drone attacks was taking place. Kiev is a bit safer, safer city. I think the, one of the most safest city as far as warfare is concerned. Uh, we have our Prime Minister coming into Ukraine as well. Um, do you believe some out-of-the-box solutions are welcome? Uh, are important. Uh, are you hopeful of something like that happen, happening? Let's hope for the best. I cannot say anything, you know, about this. This is this is really difficult time, you know. Yeah. So uh, let's hope that something will come out of this visit. Right. 
It's been wonderful speaking to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much indeed. Thank there you have it, Rajiv Gupta, uh, an entrepreneur over here for so many decades, doing incredible work in the pharma industry. These medicines go to save lives at a time when uh, routes into and out of Ukraine are so very difficult, even within the country, to ensure that basic medicines reach the right people. Uh, you know, it, it's saving lives in a very direct way. Thanks very much. Thank you for speaking Thank to us. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. Let's also listen in to this conversation that my colleague uh, in, uh, Uma Shankar Singh had. In fact, he spoke from uh, the tomb of the unknown soldier where Prime Minister Modi also laid a wreath. Take a look. This is the memorial of Poland's unknown soldiers who sacrificed their lives for Poland in different wars. This includes Polish uh, soldiers uh, who lost their lives during the First World War and the Second World War. According to information given to us here during the First World War, when such guns were used, uh, that the bodies of Polish uh, soldiers uh, who lost their lives on the uh, war front were mutilated and uh, it was not possible to identify them. Uh, their identity and names uh, could not be known. That's why this memorial has been named as Memorial of Unknown Soldiers. Here, the eternal fire remains lit 24 hours a day. Uh, this is a very similar memorial like uh, we were having at Amar Jawan Jyoti at India Gate in New Delhi and uh, the National War Memorial built after that. Guards are always posted here, which uh, uh, changes every uh, hour's uh, time. Uh, this memorial is actually a symbol of uh, Poland's military resolve. Poland had to go through many battles for its independence and had to face the powerful armies of Germany and Soviet Union. Facing many challenges, Poland gradually ensured its uh, independence. This place is not only a military uh, memorial, but also a symbol of Poland's national identity. Prime Minister Narendra Modi reaching here during his visit to Poland and honoring these unnamed soldiers of Poland on behalf of India shows how India has been stood shoulder to shoulder with Poland. Uh, be it uh, uh, the Battle of Monte Cassino, in which Indian soldiers also contributed, or the battle in which the Polish army fought on its own, suffered a uh, martyrdom uh, of thousands of soldiers and strengthened itself as a nation, paying tribute to a very important monument of uh, the wars and the barbarities imposed on the Poland shows that India not only remembers the bloody history of Poland, but also how to build a common path uh, to future with the memories of the entire history. This is a message uh, for that too. It was actually the attack on Poland that started the Second World War, so the country does have a very bloody history of achieving its independence. On that note, we slip into a very short break on India Global. We come back on the other side with India-Bangladesh ties and is something as basic as flooding leading to now a rift between the two countries. Stay with us, we come back with that. Welcome back, you're watching India Global with me, Gauri Dwedi. Now the big focus uh, right now is uh, India Bangladesh ties are they right now in troubled waters uh, Bangladesh and India are now facing catastrophic uh, uh, floods uh, particularly India's uh, Tripura region and of course uh, Bangladesh as well 15 people have uh, died so far in this massive flooding that has been going on since the 21st of August relentless rains monsoon rains are the reasons why it has been uh, it has been uh, flooding in parts of Tripura and Bangladesh but Bangladesh meanwhile the government there feels and a lot of the social media there says that and they blame India for it. They say that India released the, the dam water from the Dumbur uh, Dam and that's the reason why there has been flooding in Bangladesh. They also say that India did not give any prior warning before releasing water. India has clarified on it. The MEA has made a statement on it saying very categorically that it is not the case. Uh, what happened was relentless uh, rainfall because of which there was automatic release of uh, uh, dam water which is normally the case nothing different this time around 
but the case in point does it reflect now a growing mistrust between two neighbors in the wake of the political unrest and flux that bangladesh has witnessed in the last 3 weeks or so is this testimony to how the relationship between india and bangladesh has now taken a turn maybe in the next couple of months it could see that kind of unease as india and bangladesh work out a different framework to try and work such issues out together. That's the big debate that we are having on India Global. Joining me is Major General Lamuni Ruzman, who is the President of Bangladesh Institute for Peace and Security Studies. I also have Yashabur Rahman, who is the web editor of the Business Standard. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for uh, taking out the time. And that's my question I want to ask both of you, which is that the fact that there is mistrust on something that is a regular feature in that part of uh, the country. It happens every year. There is monsoon rainfall and because of which this kind of uh, flooding does take place very regularly but it's being raised in a manner that is indicative of a growing mistrust between Bangladesh and India is that the case let me start with you general there is a general atmosphere of mistrust due to various political reasons I also see that there is a perception that the water is released uh, without any early warning, although MEA releases have said that they did warn, but they have also said that the, the warning was continued only up to 21st, after which they say that due to power outage, communication could not be carried out. Therefore, I think there was also a lack of communication from the Indian side to Bangladesh for early warning systems to be activated. But in general, the people are, are of the perception that the Flooding happened, and the flooding happened in a tsunami-like uh, style, and it is because sufficient early warning was not given by the Indian side before opening the dams. Okay. I am reading out the statement which says, Heavy rainfall has been continuing since August 21 in the whole of Tripura and adjoining districts of Bangladesh. In the event of heavy inflow, automatic releases have been observed. It also goes on to say that data showing rising trend has been supplied to Bangladesh up to 1500 hours. On 21st of August, at 1800 hours due to flooding, there was a power outage leading to problems of communication. Still, we have tried to maintain communication through other means created for urgent transmission of data. So, uh, in fact, you know, Yashab, let me ask you this. The statement is quite clear. But why is it leading to so many questions being asked? Mohamed Yunus also, in fact, uh, asked the Indian High Commissioner to Bangladesh then to come immediately after these questions were raised. You put the dots together, it does indicate that the relationship has definitely taken a turn where even regular issues end up becoming major challenges. It does. Right. Uh, I think there's a lack of trust. Right. It does. Yashabu Rahman, please. Yashabu Rahman. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I think the environment minister today also said that they will hold a meeting with the India ambassador where they will ask these questions about the early warning system. But I think at the same time, you must take into consideration that there are hydro plants in Sikkim. There is the Tista pro, uh, the project. And because of these, there have been numerous floodings throughout Bangladesh because it has, it has made the river flow system quite erratic. So either there is flooding or there is scarcity. So when it comes to the, the flooding issue that we're discussing right now, at the same time, I don't think there is a government to government level of distrust. I see there is the need to discuss with each other. They are holding bilateral negotiations, which is, I think, the only way forward. When it comes to social media, I think social media is always full of, you know, I think the loudest voices are amplified. We saw the same thing during our transition from the previous government to this, where social media in India was also rife with allegations of all, like Hindus were being attacked all over the country. I think the same situation plays out in Bangladesh. Whether there's a rift or not, I think that is a question that remains to be seen. For now, it seems like they are holding um, discussions with each other. In fact, this was my next question. Uh, there are 54 rivers uh, that uh, India and Bangladesh share in Baring Tista. Of course, most of them, they've, there is a water sharing pact in place now. And the reason for that Tista, of course, agreement is also because of several other considerations. But the question I want to ask is that, do you think that there is no, as far as this issue highlights, that there is no breakdown of communication between India and Bangladesh. And that's really the bigger, uh, you know, takeaway. The fact that there may be political flux and violence and impacting the relationship, but the regular channels of communication remain 
robust and strong and that will ensure that the relationship withstands such challenges. Do I read this correct, Major General Manir Usman? I think there was a lack of communication. I think the communication could have been better so that early warning systems could be activated in Bangladesh. I don't quite understand why a power failure alone can stop the communication between the two authorities in two countries. There is a general feeling that if the early warning system was activated in time, more people could be saved. Okay. Uh, Yashobur Rahman, there is also a meeting that's likely between Prime Minister Modi and Mohamed Yunus uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, in the backdrop of such issues coming to light, how do you see that meeting? There's also uh, demands for Sheikh Hasina's extradition being made. There are some demands that uh, unless that extradition happens, it could impact the relationship between New Delhi and Dhaka. In the backdrop of such noises coming in, how do you see the meeting between Prime Minister Modi and uh, Mohamed Yunus? I think Bangladesh has always looked to have a very peaceful, prosperous relationship with our neighbors. And I do believe that India has also touted its neighbor, uh, neighbor first policy over the years. I do think that these, these, when these two powers sit together, they will negotiate on a basis of friendship and not on a basis of causing a rift with each other. I'm sorry, I think there's some electricity disruption right now I'm facing, but I think I can be heard. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. So, as I was saying, I think these uh, they will have a discussion on the basis of friendship, but at the same time, there are so many issues at play here, and I think all of them have to be taken into consideration. Hmm. Very quickly, because I'm running out of time, this is a question I asked to both of you, starting with you, General Sir, that in your assessment, how do you see the next couple of months as far as the India-Bangladesh relationship is concerned? What do you prioritize, General? We always want a friendly relationship with our neighbor, India. and But India should see the change realities on the ground in Bangladesh and accept that this has been a people's revolution by people's will and not assign that to any conspiracy theories. Okay. A new reality that has changed the ground should be accepted in India and a new reset of relations should be activated in that we should both work for okay. a close relationship. Yashabo Rahman, very quickly, a reset has happened. What do you think should be the priority now? I do think friendship should be the priority. At the same time, I do think if the issue of extradition comes up, India respects its part of the treaty as Bangladesh has respected its part of the treaty over the years. And I think that will just lead to a congenial environment between the two. All right. Uh, I have to leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you so much for taking out the time and joining me on this edition of India Global. With that, it's a wrap. Thanks so much for watching.